Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is Father Ed Meeks coming to you with episode 9 of our apologetics podcast entitled, You Can Go Home Again. Today, I'm going to be speaking about the Holy Eucharist, a subject that is of great relevance to us today, especially in light of the fact that the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has declared a Eucharistic revival that is underway throughout the Church in the United States. Paragraph 1324 of the Catechism, quoting two of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, namely Lumen Gentium, which is the dogmatic constitution on the Church, and Presbuterorum Ordinus, on the order of priests, states the following, quote, The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The other sacraments, and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolates, are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it. For in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ himself, our Passover. End quote. Now, We would be hard-pressed to overemphasize what the Church is teaching here. And yet, we live in a time where belief in and reverence for this most holy and most essential sacrament may be at its lowest ebb, possibly in the entire 2,000-year history of the Church. In recent years, survey after survey has concluded that a majority of self-identified Catholics in the United States believes that the Eucharist is merely a symbol of Christ's body and blood, meaning that only a minority of Catholics believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, as the Church has always believed, professed, and taught. That, my friends, is a tragedy of the first order, because this is not a matter of subjective opinion or prudential judgment. It is a rock-solid truth that the Church has taught consistently from the very beginning. A truth that is predicated on the doctrine of transubstantiation. The Catechism defines transubstantiation this way, quote, The term used to designate the unique change of the Eucharistic bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Transubstantiation indicates that through the consecration of the bread and wine, there occurs the change of the entire substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ, and the, of the entire substance of the wine into the substance of the blood of Christ, even though the appearances or species of bread and wine remain. End quote. So the fact that many Catholics believe, as Protestants do, that the Eucharist is merely a symbol of Christ's body and blood, and that it is merely a memorial meal, is tragic. By the way, let's talk about the latter concept for a moment, namely the memorial meal. It is certainly that, one in which we remember the events that brought about our redemption, or, as the priest says in the Eucharistic prayer, Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord. This, of course, is in response to Jesus' command, do this in memory of me. But the point here is that the Eucharist, even the memorial aspect of it, is oh so much more than a mere memorial. And the misconception that it is only that is based partly on an unfortunate translation. Because you see, when the English texts of the gospel say, do this in memory of me or in remembrance of me, the original Greek word, which is translated as memory or remembrance, is anamnesis, for which there is really no accurate English translation. Memory or remembrance is is about as close as we can come to a translation of that word. But the Greek word indicates a memory from the past that is actually brought into reality in the present. In the, excuse me, in the present. Perhaps an analogy would be appropriate here. If tonight you go out 
under a starlit sky and you focus in on one particular star that is, say, 1,000 light years from Earth, is what you are looking at at that moment present or is it past? The answer is it is both. It is present because you are looking at it in the present, in real time. It is past because the light that you're looking at in the present actually left that star a thousand years ago. That's something like what anamnesis communicates. And by the way, beyond the sad reality of Catholics who don't believe in Christ's real presence in the Eucharist, is the sad reality of Catholic office holders, politicians across the country who actively, aggressively, and very publicly stand in opposition to some of the Church's most fundamental moral precepts on abortion and other issues, while sacrilegiously receiving Holy Communion on a regular basis. We could spend time talking about the reasons for the massive erosion erosion in belief in Christ's real presence in the Eucharist among Catholics, or the reasons why the bishops are so passive in dealing with pro-abortion politicians. But I think our time would be better spent in examining why the Church believes as she does and what the implications are for our lives as faithful Catholics. So let's begin. The biblical underpinnings for belief in the real presence begin in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel where Jesus uses the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 as a springboard for his discourse on the Eucharist. I'm going to read a number of select verses from John 6 to show you how Jesus develops this all-important teaching. First, verses 33 through 35. Jesus says this, quote, For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Then verses 48 through 51. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus then doubles down, interestingly, in verses 53 uh, 53 through 56. Quote, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. End quote. And then we read this in verse 66. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. But notice, once these one-time disciples left him because they were offended at the teaching Of the Eucharist, there was no backpedaling on Jesus' part, no equivocating, no chasing after them. He didn't say, Wait, wait, you misunderstood. I'm only speaking symbolically. No, he let them go because he knew that they understood exactly what he was saying and they were offended by it. So Jesus lays the theological foundation in John chapter 6 for what he knows he's going to do later at the Last Supper, when he actually initiates the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Every time we offer the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we are doing what Jesus did at the Last Supper and what he told us to do. Do this, he said, not talk about this 
or think about this, but do this. We certainly should talk about the Eucharist and think about it. That's exactly what we're doing at this very moment. But of paramount importance is that we do it. Every time we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, we take our Lord at his word by doing what he told us to do and by believing and professing that his word is true, that the bread and wine truly become his sacred body and precious blood. This is my body, he said. This is my blood. Not, this is like my body. Not, this symbolizes my blood. Not, This is to remind you of my body and blood. No, he said, this is my body, which will be given up for you. This is my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Now, when we do these things, we stand as a bridge, a bridge between the historical and and the eternal. And I would like to show you how the reality of that connection is played out by looking at some of the things which we actually say in the course of doing what Jesus directed us to do in the Eucharist. First of all, let me say again that our Lord instituted the Eucharist in the context of the Passover, the Jewish Passover. That is the most sacred observance of the Old Covenant. That, of course, was no accident. Just as Jesus had said that he came not to do away with the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them, he also came not to do away with the Passover, but to fulfill it. And the way that he would uniquely fill it would be by becoming himself our Passover lamb, our Passover sacrifice. Jesus was and is both the priest and the victim. He is the sacrifice of the new Passover, which is the Mass. And so it became clear to the apostles as they participated in the Last Supper that this Passover was to be different from any that they had ever observed in their lives. Now note, we actually begin the liturgy of the Eucharist at every Mass by offering the bread and wine to God with words taken directly from the Passover Haggadah, or Seder. The priest says this as he elevates the the host and and the, the wine. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. As Jews all over the world gather in their homes to celebrate Passover every year, they intone in Hebrew those very same words, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, as they offer the unleavened bread and the wine of the Seder to Yahweh. Immediately after the offertory, the priest invites you to lift up your hearts. Lift them up where? Well, that becomes quickly evident from your response. You say, we lift them up to the Lord. In the same way that we have just lifted up the bread and wine as an offering to the Lord, so all of us are exhorted to lift up our entire lives, symbolized by our hearts, and to lift them up to the Lord as an offering. But there's more to this. We are lifting our hearts toward heaven as an acknowledgement that what we are about to do is, as I said, a bridging of the historical with the eternal, a bridging, in other words, of earth with heaven. By the way, in both the Byzantine Catholic and the Orthodox liturgies, the entire Eucharistic prayer is called the anaphora, a Greek word meaning the going up, that is, the going up to heaven. I have often said to my congregation that participating in the Mass is a way of opening a window on heaven where we are privileged to participate here in time and space in the worship that is taking place continually and eternally around the throne of the Lamb. We then move on to the actual consecration of the bread and wine, again, using Jesus' own words to transform them into his body and blood. This 
is my body. And then, so that when the apostles and we would look back on this event in light of Jesus' death, the Lord adds, this is my body, which will be given up for you. Lest there be any mistake, lest there be any confusion over what body he is talking about, the Lord is very specific. This is my body, which will be given up for you. In other words, the same body, which in less than 24 hours, you will see beaten to a bloody pulp and spit upon and nailed to the cross and laid in the tomb for you and for the whole world. This is the body I am giving you tonight. Take it, he says, and eat of it. Then, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Again, no confusion. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb was in the old covenant, shed for the deliverance of the Hebrews from death and from the bondage of Egypt, so my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, will be shed for your deliverance from sin and death and Satan. It is this blood which I give you tonight. Take and drink. The eternal nature of Jesus' sacrifice, and therefore the eternal nature of the new covenant, can be seen graphically in the vision which St. John had in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. There John says this, quote, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Again, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Did you catch that? Standing as though slain. The lamb was slain, but he was standing. Now, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain for our salvation, ever lives in heaven on our behalf. He is there in his glorified physical body, the body which still bears the marks of sacrifice, the imprint of the nails and of the spear, the body and blood which mysteriously come to us in the Eucharist under the forms of bread and wine, and which we have the privilege of then representing to the Father even as we receive it into our own bodies. That's why we refer to the Eucharist as the holy sacrifice of the Mass, not, as some would accuse us, of presuming to re-sacrifice Jesus. Re-sacrificing Jesus is not only unnecessary, it is impossible. But again, what we are doing is representing to the Father Jesus' sacrifice done once for all. We are, in effect, bringing his sacrifice, carried out 2,000 years ago, into the present, here and now, from his cross to our altar, as it is still efficacious for imparting the grace of salvation and forgiveness and healing and deliverance to mankind. Can you even begin to grasp the awesome, phenomenal, earth-shattering nature of this mystery, of this gift? Think about it for a moment. The two most precious substances in all of the universe, the body and blood of the Son of God on our altars and taken into our mortal bodies. At this point in the Mass, we then address the Lamb who is standing though slain with the threefold petition of the Agnus Dei. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Grant us peace. This is a simple acknowledgement of our continual dependence upon the mercy of God and of our desire to walk in his peace, the peace which which passes all understanding, as St. Paul describes it. This petition is quickly followed 
by a proclamation, quoting the words of St. John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world, said as the priest holds up the consecrated bread and wine, now the precious body and blood of Christ. In other words, that same Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world the same one we just petitioned to have mercy on us and grant us his peace is is here, right here, right now, hidden under the forms of bread and wine. Behold, here he is. Behold the Lamb of God. The priest then adds, Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Quoting the words, which the angel commanded St. John to write in Revelation 19.9. One more evidence that what we do every time we celebrate the Mass is a supernatural identification with and participation in the worship taking place in heaven. And so we could say quite literally and quite accurately that our participation in the Mass is the closest thing there is to heaven on earth. And so, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, I encourage you every time you approach the Lord's altar to receive his body and blood, I encourage you to prayerfully and gratefully contemplate this gift. Let's never take it for granted by letting it become rote. Let's never partake of it unworthily by approaching the altar in a state of unconfessed mortal sin. Let's never fail to acknowledge humbly our Lord's real presence in the sacrament. Let's always understand and recognize the depth of what takes place when the sinless Lamb of God, our Passover sacrifice, bids us to come and feast on his body and blood to experience the life flow that Jesus freely and lavishly pours into our lives. As always, If you are enjoying these podcasts, please like, share, and subscribe to them. And now let's conclude with God's blessing. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Amen. God bless you and I'll see you next time.